of New Baptist Church located at 610 28th Street in Huntington. You can join us at 11 o'clock this morning for our morning worship service, or if you can't get out, it's raining quite hard out there at times. Um, the, the rain's kind of cleared off the road, so you might want to venture out if you've been stuck in for three days. But we are at 610 28th Street in Huntington, and our morning worship service starts at 11 o'clock, if you can make it out for that. Or keep joining us online at newbaptistchurch.com. Um, we have Wednesday evening services also at 6.30 with Awana for the Children at 6 o'clock. We hope you stayed safe and warm and staying well, and we are glad to have you with us this morning. Will you join us in prayer? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the beauty of the snow. Thank you for keeping everyone safe and for the things that you have given us and the way you watch out over us. Pray for those that are sick. Pray especially for the Powers family and for, for them to, to get well and for Rebecca to get well and that you would just touch her hand and heal her body and, and bring, bring them back to us and, and that um, things will start looking up and the healing process will, will go into full gear and just really hit it hard. Pray for all those that are dealing with illnesses and, and those that have lost loved ones and and just comfort them and let them know that you're with them and let them feel your presence and so that they could start healing and and looking for a better future and and the times that they miss their loved ones will that that will always happen but that you will just give them strength to make it through day by day through that be with us this morning as Robin brings us the message and also as John brings us the message in song. In your name I pray. Amen. John Steinspring will be leading us in this special music. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Thank you so much, John. So much message in that song. Yeah, powerful. Thank you very much. Our message this morning is Pastor Robin, even though we already heard a message in song. <laughs> yes, we did. Oh, and oh, how good it is to be with you. And I want to thank John. Took me back, John, to songs I've sung for years and written on my heart, and I hummed with you through it. I hope others did too. Well, again, welcome to the Radio Bible Class here at New Baptist Church. I'm Robin Crouch, one of the pastors here at New Baptist, and it's our joy to be sharing the service with you, this radio broadcast, uh, particularly for those who uh, cannot get out. But if you do not have a church home and uh, would like to join us again with Sherry's welcome, let me invite you to join us on Sunday mornings at 11 uh, here at uh, 610 28th Street. Uh, it's the old skating rink across from uh, where Huntington East High School uh, used to be. Uh, and we would enjoy having you. We do request that you wear a mask with the given uh, right now with the surge and things. We ask that you come, uh, but just uh, come and worship with us. We look forward uh, to that, and if you cannot get out and would like to join us online, you can do so. Uh, again, the link can be found on our church website at newbaptistchurch.com. Uh, as we begin today, uh, join me in prayer. Our Father, I give you thanks for your word, and I thank you for uh, the way that Jesus teaches that is, uh, Lord, it just draws us all in. Uh, and it is so practical and uh, really fairly easy to understand, difficult to live at times, and yet, uh, Lord, we thank you. I pray now that as we uh, jump into your word today that uh, you would use it in us uh, to make us more like your son and allow us to live the life that he intended us to live and to share that life with the people around us. We pray this in your name. Amen. When I was pastor at First Baptist Church in Wheeling a number of years ago, uh, we needed to build an elevator. Now, understand our building was on five levels. The sanctuary level was at the street level, and then you came down the hill to the parking lot that was down at the bottom of the fifth level. Well, it really became an issue navigating all those steps to get up to the sanctuary, uh, and so we needed to put in an elevator. Uh, as we were doing the work on that, uh, we had to do core drillings, uh, and we had to go down, ended up, our core drillings took us down 49 feet before they hit bedrock. What was safe for us to build on? Something solid to build on. One of my favorite cities uh, is San Francisco to visit. Uh, I was on staff with Campus Crusade in my last year there, uh, back in the early 70s. I was stationed uh, at the international headquarters at that time in San Bernardino. And about every, once every couple of months, uh, we would get a group together uh, and drive up to San Francisco and spend the weekend just exploring all around San Francisco. On one of those trips, my best friend there at the time, uh, Tom Stevens and I, uh, spent an entire afternoon just looking at the Golden Gate Bridge. We were uh, over where it was anchored, but we spent the day looking at that engineering marvel. And I want to tell you something that might surprise you if you're planning to make a trip to San Francisco. Uh, you might want to know the safest place to be in San Francisco really is in the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, that bridge uh, would probably withstand an earthquake uh, you know, way up on the Richter scale. Uh, it will not fall, and it's for a couple of reasons. Uh, first uh, is that it's flexible, and if you've ever been on it, you know that sway that's in it, and it is there. Uh, you can feel it when you drive across it. You can feel it when you're walking there. Now, you don't walk across the, the Golden Gate Bridge, but you can feel the sway. But the other reason it stands is the bridge is a uh, just a marvel of cantilever and suspension in construction. Every bit of concrete, every bit of steel in that entire bridge, all of it relates to one piece to another. So they all are related to each other. Every piece of metal uh, finally relates to those two giant cables that you're so familiar with, you see from pictures. 
that finally come to rest in two great pillars on each side uh, that are set down into bedrock. The two anchors, uh, that's the genius of the suspension bridge. Every single piece of metal, of concrete, is preoccupied with the foundation. Uh, you don't see uh, big cables going from the top of the bridge over to the Transamerica building or from the top of the bridge over to the giant redwoods in, uh, on the other side over in Marin County. Those, everything is related to those cables that are sunk into the bedrock. They are anchored there and the bridge is suspended. Our scripture today, now I tell you that story because it relates to our scripture. If you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn to John chapter 15 because our scripture today teaches us the same lesson of our relationship to Jesus, to Christ. So let's read that together. Uh, John chapter 15, starting in verse 1, says this. Uh, John is writing, but Jesus is speaking. Jesus says this, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that w and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. In this passage, Jesus declares, I am the vine. Well, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us today? Well, let me put it in context for you because it's important to know when this is being said because, uh, well, it just I think it adds more to its meaning. Jesus has just finished what we call the Last Supper with the disciples in the upper room. Uh, he has told them some things. Uh, they've not fully understood them. Uh, we know that from reading the scripture. Uh, they are now on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the Lord will pray for them and then be betrayed and arrested. Evidently, on the way, Jesus is talking and teaching his disciples, and that conversation is what we find in chapters uh, 15 and 16 of uh, John's Gospel. Uh, in this chapter, Jesus is pictured for us as the true vine. I can imagine Jesus and his men walking through the darkened streets of the city uh, and passing beyond its walls out into the countryside. And during this time of year, it would have been in mid-April, uh, the grapevines would be beginning to blossom, the promise of a fresh harvest. As Jesus walked with his disciples there, Perhaps he reached down and took a vine in his hands and used it to teach this object lesson. His desire is to teach them about the most vital relationship they have in their lives, the one with him and with the Father. Now, these are not frivolous words. They're not unimportant words. In a few short hours, Jesus will be arrested and crucified. The disciples need to hear what he is saying, and I would add, so do we. So what was Jesus teaching? What was he teaching about the Father? He says that the Father is the vine dresser. He tends the vines and the branches. He determines their usefulness and fruitfulness and whether to prune or to pitch the branches. Now, I don't know a lot about, in fact, I don't know anything about raising grapes. Uh, when we lived in, in our house in Ona, 
uh, the previous owners had planted some grapes uh, in the backyard. To me, they just looked like vines, and I didn't know how to prune them, so I, we never got a grape off of any of them and lived there uh, three years. So uh, I don't know anything. But God is the vine dresser, and the vine dresser knows exactly what to do. He knows what to prune, and he knows that the pruning this year will determine the success of the crop next year. The vine dresser, he knows what to prune, what to leave alone, and what to pitch. Jesus says that the Father is the vine dresser. But what does he teach about himself? He simply says that he is the true vine. Now, throughout the Old Testament, Israel is referred to as a vine. And here, uh, Jesus contrasts the difference between the unfaithfulness of the Old Testament people and his perfect faithfulness as a source of life for all believers. This will be contrasted here, and, and his audience will understand what he's doing. He has life in himself, and as the vine, gives life to the branches. He gives life to those who trust and follow him. He says, I am the vine. Now, what's he say about fruit? Well, bearing fruit is the sole purpose of the branch. You take away the fruit, and the branch has no purpose at all. It's not a tree that it might give shade. It's a vine, small, twisted, no purpose but to bear fruit. Unless maybe you want to swing from it to uh, swing out over water or play Tarzan. But it really has no purpose apart from bearing fruit. The fruit is the result of the branch being in the vine, and that's the desired end for the branch is to bear fruit. But what about the branch? Well, the branch has two purposes, as I said, uh, uh, because it is between the vine and the fruit. The branch connects the fruit to the vine. It's the conduit through which the fruit receives all it needs. The branch is to bear fruit. There's no more important lesson for the disciples uh, that they needed than this. Jesus' earthly ministry will soon be over, and theirs will be beginning. Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. It is our fruit that identifies us. Have you ever been around someone and you just know, boy, that person is a follower of Jesus? You can just tell by the way they act, by the things they say, by just the fruit of their life. It's our fruit that identifies us. And fruit is the sole result of our existence in the vine. Now, for the branch that does not bear fruit, that does not bear fruit, Scripture here says the vine dresser takes that branch away. Now, the most common understanding of that, uh, and you read commentaries and they're going to tell you this, is that the branch is taken and kind of pitched away. That's the way we read this. It's kind of put away. But if you were to look at the words closely, the word really can mean to be lifted up, to be taken away from its current situation and put in something new. Uh, it can be mean set, setting or laying aside, lifting up so it can bear fruit. It may be that that particular branch is in a place where it's not receiving proper light, maybe not uh, proper moisture, those kind of things. So the vine dresser lifts it and places it where it has the opportunity to bear fruit. Again, that's the vine dresser's knowledge of what to do, of, of what to prune, what to lift up, what to take away. Now, surely there are branches that are taken away that have uh, served their purpose, that are no longer bearing fruit. But another thing this passage teaches us is to abide in the vine. You see, we are to be at home in, to abide. I don't know about you, but that word abide, we don't use it much anymore. Uh, but if you were to ask me where I live and 
drive by my house, I would say, that's where I abide. That's where I live. It means to be at home there. The vine is our source of all life. We're to take life from the vine and pass it through to the fruit. That's our job. We are the branches, Jesus said, and we're to take nourishment from the vine, pass it through, connect it to the fruit. The fruit will not exist if the branch is not connected to the vine. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Again, Jesus said, apart from me or apart from the vine, you can do nothing. The vine can do nothing. It's useless. But in the vine, the branch bears fruit. And in fact, it says it bears much fruit. So how do we abide in the vine? How do you and I begin to be at home in our relationship with God? Well, we do so by investing time and energy in our relationship with the Lord. Let me suggest just a couple of ways that you might want to do that, a few ways. Invest some time regularly in reading God's Word. Spending time with what God has said to us. The Bible, as we have it, is God's revelation of Himself to us. And if we want to know the God we say we serve, then we need to spend time. And He has revealed Himself to us in His Word, and we call that the Bible. I would invite you to join us here at New Baptist in reading through the Bible in 2022. It's something we encourage our people to do every year. There are plenty of plans available. Again, this is the 9th of January. If you haven't started, you're not too far behind. You can get caught up. Uh, but even if you don't, uh, just read it in a year. If you start now, January 8th next year, you'll have the Bible read through. Use a plan. There are plenty available online. We have some here at the church we'd be glad to share with you. Uh, but get one and use it. Second, you can invest some time talking with the Lord. Now, we call that prayer. Now, there's no special language or code to use. Uh, I had a friend who used to say that, uh, you know, God, uh, there's no special language uh, that we use. God knows the content of your heart. Uh, and that's what's most important. You know, it's not the words we use. Uh, I don't speak in these and thous and wouldest and couldest, and I doubt if thou doest. No special language. Talk as you would to a friend. It's a conversation between you and the Lord. Third, invest some time in worship with other Christians. It's best done in person with a church family. Now, I understand that many of you who listen to this each week cannot get out. And I believe God gives you uh, uh, grace for that. But if you are able to get out, there is no substitute for being in person with your church family, with a group of believers where you can grow and study, where you can invest your time, your energy, and find a ministry. Uh, all of that it's hard to do by yourself, but if you can and you can get out. Now, again, I know there are times when people cannot, and I believe God gives you special grace. But if you're able, you need to find a church family and invest yourself there. And then fourth, you need to invest some time in fellowship with other Christians. You know, there's just nothing that helps you grow more than being with folks who know Christ and are following him. Their examples to follow, their encouragement, uh, they challenge at times. Uh, I can't tell you how important uh, my friendships are with certain people who have known me for years and years but hold me accountable, ask me how things are going. But we fellowship together, we pray together, we laugh together, we vacation together, we do all kinds of stuff. Fellowship is important. Find a group where you can grow and invest yourself and build those deep personal relationships. Now, as we look at this passage, that's just some things you can do. But how do we respond to what Jesus said? See, in the passage, we are to remain in Jesus. There's no question. That's the command. Jesus in us, us in him. 
Bill Knievel of Oklahoma, Nebraska, or excuse me, of Omaha, Nebraska, uh, in the Christian Reader, uh, related this story. He said, our friend's seven-year-old daughter told her three-year-old sister she had found Jesus and hidden him in her heart. The younger daughter later went and looked at her dad and said, Dad, I found Jesus and I hid him under the bed. <laughs> we must ask ourselves, are we abiding in Jesus and he in us? Are we at home in Jesus and is he at home in us? There's a little booklet that's been out for years and years called My Heart, Christ's Home. Is there a room in your heart where Jesus, you don't want him open that door, where he's not welcome? Say, so you can come here, you can go anywhere, but just not there. You see, at home, when I abide, when I'm at home, I can go anywhere, open any door. I just, I'm at home there throw my feet up, kick my shoes off, I'm at home. Question is, is Jesus at home in you? That's what it means to abide. And second, what fruit are you bearing? You see here, the fruit is not personal traits, but rather it's other Christians. The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. Now that's sobering, isn't it? John Guest, many have called him the Billy Graham of Anglican preachers. In a preaching class I took from him, said this once, if the devil can keep us from doing the work of the evangelist, then the battle he lost at Calvary, he has won in the field of our ministry. That's sober. Now hear the words of Jesus again. They call for action. They also give us great hope. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in him and I in him, in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Pray with me. Father, I thank you again for your word. I thank you for the truth. Lord, teach us to live and to abide in you, to be at home in you and you at home in us, so that we might be the people you've called us to be, so that our lives might bear fruit, the people around us might be drawn to the Savior we serve. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.